It's one of our Māori cultural practices is to open our gatherings with uh, the, an incantation, or as we call it, a karakia, and that really sets the intention uh, for the hui and connects us with the creative forces of our world. So, uh, me karakia tato. Whaia, whaia, whaia ki te uru tapunui a tāne, tāne te wai ora, tāne te pūkenga, tāne te wānanga, tāne te whakaputa nei ki te whaia o ki te amara. Tu te ngana, tu te maranga, te tuhi te rarama, tēnei au e noho matara nei e rongo, whakaeri ake ki runga, tūturu whakamaua ki a tīna, haumi e hui e tāhi. And uh, this broadly uh, translates to uh, may we follow in the, the great footsteps of the atua, or the deity tāne, uh, who traversed the heavens to pursue the baskets of knowledge and let us pursue today clarity and enlightenment, skills and strengths, just as Tane did. And with these fruits, may we be able to embrace trial and error, be both cautious and bold, and radiate with energy to bring positive change to our world. May we do it with alertness and energy and strategy, just like the Atua or deity named Tu, and we also ask the Atua Rongo to ensure that we carry out uh, this work under the mantle of calmness and peace. Let that be a, our commitment and let that set the tone and intention for our session today. Kia ora tato, back to you, Yosef. Kia ora, Shay. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this great conversation with Tim Ferriss and Shay Wright on how to raise and catalyze a generation of e-commerce entrepreneurs in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The reason why we wanted to have this conversation at this point in time is because of the massive move to doing business online and the digital movement is being further accelerated by the COVID uh, crisis that we're facing right now. And the world is very much connected, but also separated through the physical device that we have in this very specific moment. So in the next hour, 25 minutes, we're gonna cover a number of topics and themes in, in, in this area here. Uh, we'd just love to kick off by doing a brief introduction of the people we have here. So many of you might know who Tim Ferriss is. He is the host of the Tim Ferriss Show podcast, which has over 500 million downloads so far and author of five of number one New York Times and uh, Wall Street Journal best-selling uh, books, including the Four Hour Workweek. Uh, he's a technology investor and advisor. Uh, he's also pretty involved in the mental health and well-being space, and he's uh, Edmund Hillary Fellow of Cohort Six. So super thrilled to have you, Tim. And if you want to read more about Tim and his work, you can go to tim.blog to check out more. And on the other side, we have Shay Wright from here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Shay is the co-founder of Te Fare Huka Huka with Travis, which is a social enterprise that is working to improve the lives of 10 million indigenous people. And they've been running different types of programs on the ground, specifically in providing e-commerce and online business training programs, which we'll hear very shortly about. Uh, Shay is also part of different uh, government advisory boards, including the Maori Economic Development Advisory Board. And he's also Edmund Hillary Fellow of Cohort 6. So super thrilled to have you guys here. Uh, to check out Shay's work, you can go to twh.co.nz as well as shaywright.co.nz. So thanks so much for joining here, guys. Um, this is going to be a fun conversation. If we zoom out and really look at the world where we're at right now, historically, New Zealand has had what we call the tyranny of distance being so far away, physically removed from where the rest of the world is. And over the last few decades, we've seen greater level of connectivity with, between New Zealand and the world. And COVID is having quite an effect of that. So we'd love just to dive deep into what are the bigger opportunities you see for New Zealand in this climate of change that we're seeing and even looking at the next 10, 20, 20 years ahead of us. Tim, maybe if you could start and, and Shay share with us from the local lens. Happy to start. Thanks for the kind introduction. And I'm honored to be here. So I'll do my best not to 
sound like a complete idiot when I answer questions. Uh, zooming out, I'll just provide a little bit of background context, which is since the four hour work week came out in 2007, I've had the opportunity to observe at this point, probably tens of thousands of businesses through not just readers, but the permutations and the development of technology and then my partnerships and investments with various companies that provide a lot of the plumbing or the, the tools and infrastructure for even tens of thousands of additional companies. And what has been fascinating and horrifying about COVID uh, among many other things is how it is both a great disabler and a great enabler. It's accelerated a lot of trends. And so, as you mentioned, tyranny of distance, the, the physical isolation of New Zealand, I think presents many benefits. There, there's a certain uh, sovereignty and uh, natural defense that New Zealand has, uh, which provides it with great advantages in a time of pandemic. And it also has handicaps, geographically speaking, if you're relying on uh, pure domestic product. And I, I see as I'm witnessing the acceleration and convergence of e-commerce trends in the United States and globally speaking, I'm, I'm tracking a lot of the data that never before has it been more important uh, for businesses in New Zealand to have the ability to export. And that could be physical product, it could be digital product, but the interconnectedness of New Zealand with the global marketplace and the opportunity to connect with consumers, customers, clients outside of the geographic islands that comprise New Zealand, I think has, has become ever more important. And this is, this is true, not just for New Zealand. Uh, and, I, and I think that it's easy to lose sight of the fact that although the larger companies say in New Zealand or the larger companies in the United States get the majority of media coverage, the percentage of gross domestic product and employment that is provided by small dis businesses is, is enormous. I'll just give you an example outside of the United States because I don't wanna make this seem purely US centric, at least from my viewpoint. So for instance, in the Australian state of Victoria, I'm reading this here, more than 600,000 small businesses, those with fewer than 20 employees represent half of all private sector jobs and more than one third of the state's output in goods and services, right? And, and that's, that's a, it's an incredibly large percentage of both employment and output and export. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's, it's incredibly important to focus on educating the uh, small businesses, both existent and potential in New Zealand uh, in an economic recovery and looking forward to a, an accelerating technological world where e-commerce is going to be of increasing importance. Hmm. Actually, hmm. New Zealand, 97% of enterprises are small businesses and yeah. they employ 29% of the country's workforce and contribute 28% yeah. of the GDP. What's also go. interesting is 70% of them are just a, a business owner run. So they don't hire additional people. So they got to figure out everything by yeah. themselves. Yeah, and I'll just add, I'm glad you, you mentioned this. So there are, there are many options and technologies that can allow small businesses to scale. And New Zealand, I think, has a very uh, advantageous brand in a, uh, in a global marketplace, right? Because you might say, let's say Lithuania or Estonia, and people are like, I don't have any association with these countries. And uh, it really, the association is the brand. What is a brand? It's, it's a consistent association. And with New Zealand, I mean, you have safety, serenity, adventure, you have these very well-developed brand associations uh, that I think lend very well to export. Uh, so I think that is, that is a huge advantage that has not been fully capitalized on. Mm. 
Yeah, when we think about, like you mentioned, Yosef, 90% of businesses in New Zealand are like, we're not just small, we're really quite micro, you know, zero to five employees. So when we think about being able to turn on really small businesses, which at the moment have very limited reach, limited revenues, the ability to use e-commerce and online as a mechanism to enable them to grow is, is huge. And we're certainly seeing that in the businesses that we work with. I think if I was to sort of, you know, sit here in New Zealand's context and reflect back on our, our economy and where, where we were pre-COVID, where we are now, um, you know, we, we're a very traditional economy, really. We're a land of meat, milk, and honey. For a long time, that has been about what New Zealand uh, economies represented. Um, and we still have an agricultural sector, which is, you know, the largest industry uh, in our economy, was followed by tourism, but of course has now been uh, decimated with COVID. So I think in relation to that large sector, the, the opportunity uh, through e-commerce is for us to actually get closer to customers. We are an export nation when we think about the, the kind of goods that we produce and how small we are as a domestic market. So we need to be export facing. And so with e-commerce, we can actually get closer to that customer. We can be market facing. And that enables us to then move beyond just selling commodity goods into a mini, um, uh, distributors in the process, but actually sell directly to the end customer and to position our products directly to them in the language that they speak in and using the keywords that they use, not what we think that they want to use. And that's been a really interesting journey for ourselves going around e-commerce is to see that actually we need to be utilizing the things that are top of mind for the customer in a different part of the world and using the words that they will be searching for in order to be able to promote New Zealand products to them. So I think there's that promotion uh, and accessibility piece for global markets. Um, I think also that applies to tourism. And while we are facing a lot of tourism challenges at the moment, by utilizing digital marketing in a far more sophisticated way, when we do open our borders back up, we'll be able to be able uh, we'll be able to to utilize some of those. Uh, value propositions that Tim's talking about, you know, safety and serenity, utilize this highly trusted brand that we have and actually increase the value of our tourism. Because while it's been one of our largest sectors, in fact, for a while it was the largest, it's actually quite a low paying sector and it's seasonal and there, there's just issues with tourism, which can in part be addressed as we move up the value chain of our tourism offerings. Um, and, and then to reference uh, beyond physical products, you know, there's the opportunity for us to tap into a global market with our exporting our knowledge and our IP. And we're seeing some really great examples of New Zealand businesses who are leading at the edge there too. Um, two well-known ones are Zero and Pushpay. Uh, and what, we, what we're seeing is we can actually grow technology businesses here in New Zealand that can serve the world. And, we, and, and I think the legitimacy of doing that is becoming more pronounced as we have great examples and as we start to establish the ecosystem um, that sits around uh, enabling e-commerce opportunities and online businesses. And that ecosystem includes government, yes. It includes investment, um, particularly if you're looking at tech. And it also includes the expertise that's needed to enable these businesses to grow, which of course with um, the return of New Zealanders to our shores, through COVID, I'm sure that we're going to see a far more knowledge-rich um, community who are able to really turn New Zealand businesses on. And, and then the last point I just want to make here is around the, the, the ability for e-commerce as well and, and a huge opportunity for us to be doing more uh, purchasing from local businesses. Um, you know, not, a lot of our money traditionally flows offshore when we think about goods. Um, and... What we're seeing is actually that, that, that e-commerce since COVID is driving a lot more local business. And New Zealand Post released these findings that showed that um, online spending was up 83% during our lockdown on last year. And since then, it's actually um, been up 30%. Uh, it's remained at 30% from last year. So we are seeing a continuation of that trend. And 70% of those sales have actually been domestic online sales. You know, half a million Kiwis 
have joined the New Zealand made products Facebook group, which is now called Choice with two O's. So it's just showing that we do care about buying local. And I think that that is another really massive opportunity to ensure that we have more of a circulating economy in New Zealand rather than one that just exports profits overseas. Hmm. Sure, actually, it'll be really interesting to hear from you a bit more about the Maori economy and how, what frame of mind do you have to understand the indigenous led business and indigenous economy, since that's an area you've been educating a lot of people around, but also involved in and in, in supporting the e-commerce to thrive in, in, within the Maori economy. Yeah, and you know, the whole reason that we started to look into e-commerce was because we were working in the Māori economy and we saw the great potential of it to enable better business, better outcomes. And often the Māori businesses that we work with are actually social enterprises. They exist for a social purpose and business is the vehicle through which they enable the, they get the resources to enable better social outcomes. Now, there's some limitations in the Māori economy, you know, like, and, and particularly given that a lot of the collectively owned assets of the Māori economy are in those traditional sectors and are commodity businesses. And there's this great story and ability for us to really draw on the brand of indigeneity and add that to the sustainability elements and the traceability and all these other brilliant things which New Zealand is known for and build world-class Māori businesses or indigenous companies that can play at both ends of the market, you know, that make the stuff, but don't just make it, that can actually then add value to their product, demonstrate the benefits through science and research, and then sell that product directly to the end customer and therefore capture the whole value chain. I think that was a really key reason why we uh, decided e-commerce was a mechanism. And the second reason was because Māori um, experience uh, a lot worse socioeconomic challenges than the rest of our, our country. You know, Māori um, household incomes are um, significantly less. Māori average incomes are about 30,000 New Zealand, which is $20,000 US per year. What we were seeing is if we can add another $250 into the household of Māori families every week, just $250, we're actually increasing the household income by 50%. Hmm. So if, if we do that, um, the, 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 the leverage effect on that is huge in terms of the, those families to then be able to provide um, and live a far more prosperous life. And that's where e-commerce is a real interesting opportunity to create that extra $250 of extra income in terms of like side hustles. So that's kind of where we started with these foundations of going, how do we utilize e-commerce to do more value chain uh, Māori business, as well as to enable Māori families to set up their own side incomes. And, and then of course, COVID came along. And what we saw was actually all these small Māori businesses were unable to trade. They were unable to serve their, even their local communities physically because there was no place where everyone could gather to buy product and exchange product. And um, if we fast forward to now, uh, just this weekend, over the last two days, we've finished a workshop uh, for our e-commerce program called Kahawi Te Ao, And we've just had 40 new e-commerce businesses graduate from that program. They're set up, they're live, and they're selling product. And what's interesting is there is such a broad range of those businesses in terms of what they're selling, from traditional jewelry through to art, through to clothing products that have the Māori language on there, um, baby blankets, there were he a lot of healers on there. So it's not just our products we're seeing, uh, our cultural products, it's actually mm. also a lot of our cultural services as well, which can be facilitated through technology, through digital, you know, the language revitalization courses. And I think that that's a really special thing, Yosef. It's a vehicle that Māori can actually take their strengths, take their products and take our culture, share it with the world and create stronger, more resilient households and economic sovereignty. Thanks so much for providing such a frame of the potential and the challenges here on the ground in New Zealand. Um, I'd love for us to dive deeper into the mechanics and understand what does it actually mean to build an e-commerce business and what are the principles to follow? 
And one thing I'd like to invite the people who are streaming online here is if there are questions that you have, feel free to, to have it in the chat. And my colleagues, uh, Anthony is gonna help curate a few of those and include them in the conversation. So Tim, you've been part of educating a lot of people in the process of building an online business. Um, what are some of the misconceptions and lessons that you like to share about one, what does it take to launch an online business and how do you make it successful? I'll give it a go. Uh, the first thing I would say is uh, it's helpful, I think, to, for the purposes of dissecting this, to separate online from the word business. And to think about entrepreneurship first and foremost and building successful, differentiated, small scale businesses that can grow quickly and using technology as an accelerant, if that makes any sense. Because I, I, I think the distinction between retail or traditional and e-commerce is less relevant than the distinction between poor businesses or commodity businesses and value added differentiated businesses, really. So first and foremost, we're really talking about how to create new categories and to dominate different niches, I think effectively, and then using technology to deliver those goods or services. As far as misconceptions, uh, I, I would say that there are a lot of entrepreneurial misconceptions that apply equally to e-commerce businesses. The, the first would be, that you should bet the farm or quit your job and then start a business. This is almost universally a terrible idea. And if, if you read the cover stories from magazines, although I'm dating myself, not many people read magazines these days unless they're in an airport, which fewer and fewer people are right now. But you get the idea, the sort of lionized romanticized stories of like these swashbuckling entrepreneurs who risk it all and then hit a home run is, is actually a very small slice of the most successful entrepreneurs. The, the most successful serial entrepreneurs are very good at mitigating risk, meaning decreasing risk. And they're, they're first and foremost risk mitigators, not risk takers. And one way that that can apply to solo printers, meaning one person entrepreneurs who decide they want to uh, start a business of some type is starting, starting a business while you still have a job, honestly. So the misconception is you should quit your job and burn your ships and then start a company. I think that's very dangerous and unnecessary. So starting a side hustle, as Shea put it, some type of experimental uh, real world laboratory for yourself in the world of entrepreneurship while you still have a safety net of some type of income. And that income could be from a job, that income could be from unemployment, that income could come in very different forms. That's number one, is that uh, good entrepreneurs are risk mitigators, not risk takers. Um, and, and risk for me is the likelihood of an irreversible negative outcome. So you are going to be taking systematic actions that are uncomfortable for you because they're new, but that does not make them risky as I define it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, secondly, misconceptions would be that you need to be a technologist to use technology. This isn't true for social media. You know, how many people who use Facebook know how to code? Almost nobody. How many people who use YouTube know how to you know, <laughs> and code video, almost nobody. Uh, you don't have to know how the microwave works to use a microwave. Similarly, particularly since 2007, the technology has evolved tremendously to the point where non-technologists can use tools very effectively. Whether those tools are, I'll give a few examples. Those tools might be say WordPress, for building content sites or even e-commerce sites. You have companies like Shopify, which I know very, very well because I was one of the first advisors, if not the first advisor to Shopify when they had 10 employees or so uh, for e-commerce and really soup to nuts, A to Z 
as a suite of technologies. You have fresh books for invoicing. If you are say billing for services and time, you have uh, any number of payment processors like Stripe. So the ability to put these things together and to learn from organizations like Shays that exist to provide information and tools has never been easier. Uh, I would say also that, and I'm gonna zoom out, that was kind of on, on the micro independent player perspective or level. But if we zoom out, I, I think it's, it's worthwhile as a framework to, and this will, will apply to any conversation we might have about government as well and their role in fostering this, that you can think of, of, of possibly three ingredients that are necessary to, to really cultivate a fast growing environmental, uh, excuse me, entrepreneurial culture. Uh, one is information. You need, you need the right instruction. Uh, you need the right tools. Number two is inspiration. And that sounds like a very hand wavy abstract term. But what I mean by that is you need to have role, uh, role models and examples you can showcase to demonstrate what is possible. And for some people that might be a Richard Branson, but for other people of a different demographic, a different age, it might be someone else, right? So really showcasing different faces, different forms of innovation. And when, when we talk about diversity, for instance, it's not just skin color or gender, it could be showing introverts who are really successful entrepreneurs and innovators because the extroverts are those who tend to get the most press. <laughs> you do not need to be an extrovert to be a successful e-commerce entrepreneur. And then the third, so we have information, inspiration. The third would be incentives. And I think that's more a conversation of structural incentives that can be put in place because the incentive to make money is obvious, right? The incentive to add, mm -hmm. let's just say in, in, in Shay's example, $250 uh, a week to income, which boosts household annual income by 50% that intrinsic motivation is going to be there, but the, there are things that the government can do to make it attractive and more attractive for people to begin to kick the tires and at least take the first few steps to testing the entrepreneurial waters. And there's going to be a lot of fallout, right? There's a, there's a big funnel at the top, but if you, can, if you can get a large number of people into the game, onto the playing field for say a few weeks or a month, you might start out with 10,000, you might lose 9,000, but that's okay because you might end up at the very bottom with 10 companies that each employ thousands of people. <laughs> and we've seen that over and over again with the, the collaborations that, that I've worked mm -hmm. on in other places in the world. So there's no reason that I can identify to think that it wouldn't work in New Zealand uh, to incentivize in a bunch of systematic ways. So there's the information, the inspiration, the incentives. Uh, so so th those are a few of the lenses through which I look at these things. Um, you don't need a lot of money to make money. That's another BS mm. Mon mm. mantra that has no basis in reality. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're the vast majority of successful entrepreneurs of every color and creed bootstrapped. They started mm. with next to nothing. And if you can't build a business with very little or no money, you're going to have you would have even more trouble if you had money because you would spend it poorly. And I remember I was an early investor in Alibaba way back in the day and pre-IPO and Jack Ma, I'm going to paraphrase his quote, but he said in the beginning we had, we had huge advantages. We had no experience. We had no plan and we had no money. And that made him and his team focus on being creative within these constraints. So I think that the constraints are a gift. That is, that is the truth. And having a lack of experience or a lack of capital can actually be a huge advantage in creating something unique and not mm -hmm. just something that is a copy and imitation of something that already exists. Hmm. So if I'm hearing you well, you're saying you basically can start a, an e-commerce business while having a job just manage. You should. I'm not you. just saying you can. You I'm saying you should. You should. Yeah. So yeah. everyone should have a side hustle. 
building a, 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 an e-commerce business, manage what's going to kill you. So manage the existential risks that you have and start with little. The less you have, the more creative you're going to be to work within the boundaries that you have. Yeah, I would also say that uh, we hear these things that we sometimes don't question that are common knowledge, but they're actually not accurate, right? Like we only use 10% of our brains, complete nonsense. There's no basis in science for that. Mm. You need to drink eight glasses of water a day. There's, it's completely made up. I don't know where it came from. There's just like no basis anywhere for that. We also hear things like 90% of startups fail within the first year or whatever it might be, right? And a lot, of, a lot of businesses do fail, but I will say that if you go through a handful of exercises and practices in the beginning, if you ask a handful of good questions, and I could talk about resources that can help with these things, if the businesses go through a, a couple of very simple steps in the beginning, or I should say the entrepreneurs, before they spend a bunch of money and buy a bunch of inventory and so on, that... I would say 90% of them survive. Mm. I, I, I think it's completely the opposite. You can really stack the deck in your favor if you do a few things in the beginning. And if it doesn't work, let's just say, and I've had plenty of things don't work uh, that, that don't work. I've had plenty of things fail. The, the, what you're doing in the very beginning is you're capping your downside. Like we, th we think of uh, Richard Branson, who I've had on my podcast, I've spent time with him as this crazy maverick risk taker. He is actually first and foremost, really good at capping his downside. If you look at how he started Virgin Atlantic and so on with the planes and negotiating the leases so they could be bought back, he was very good at hedging and making sure that he would not lose excessively if it failed. And you can do that with, with small businesses in the beginning, particularly when the infrastructure, the tools that you might use are so inexpensive. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's no need to bet the farm and you really shouldn't. Mm. I think beyond that, Tim, you know, there's also the potential to be really data driven with e-commerce because you can, you can do things like what you preach around AB split testing, but you can also really like look at how big is a market, how many people are actually searching for those kind of keywords and that ability to ability to be more data driven, I think means we have, we can then have less assumptions, which does in, in a sense, mitigate risk going into whatever that business is. And we can start small test, learn, iterate, and then um, build up from there. Yeah, totally agree. Hmm. Uh, why don't we just go down a little bit on what you touched upon, Tim, you know, what, what are the business principles, but also entrepreneurial principles, if you call it that, that one should be thinking about if they're looking to start an e-commerce business or even if they've already started, how to make it successful? Well, well let's start with required reading. And I'm not gonna mention my book. <laughs> if people wanna read, read one of those, that's, that's fine. But I'll just mention a few things because I, I did guest lecture in high-tech entrepreneurship for a long time at Princeton uh, twice a year for from 2003 to 2013 or so. And there were a few essays and books that were always on the required reading list that did not fall off. A lot of things came in, fell off, but there were a few that were constant. The first one is 1000 True Fans by Kevin Kelly. You can find it at kk.org. That's my dog drinking water in the background. One of the joys of doing things during COVID. It's always the family together. Uh, so <laughs> one, thank you, Molly, for drinking so loudly. Uh, <laughs> 1,000 <000, laughs> 1, True Fans by Kevin Kelly, kk.org, is required reading. And I'm going to come back to why that's important in a moment. Uh, the second is really short. Uh, there is a book called The 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing, and there is a chapter in that book called the law of category. And that law of category ch uh, chapter is incredibly important. So what 1000 true fans and the law of category combine to teach is number one, identifying your smallest viable audience with a product that is very specific. In general, what that means is you are going to be playing in an area you know very well. You'll be scratching your own itch, right? So how did I start my first business? 
part of my preparation and research was really simple. I went through my credit card statement and I looked at what I spent money on. I looked at where I spent stupid amounts of money as a percentage of my income. So it's like, all right, where am I price insensitive? Where am I kind of spending a, a, a stupid amount of money? And I looked at it, I was like, all right, these are areas that clearly I'm willing to pay for. And I also know a lot about them because I am the market. I am one of the customers. And if you are one of your own possible customers, it makes it much easier to understand how to reach those people. For instance, with the four hour work week, I knew in the beginning, in the beginning, and this is very, uh, it's important to recognize that your initial target market is not the total market. Hmm. It's really important to grasp because in the very beginning for the four hour work week, my goal was to sell 20,000 copies of this book each week for the first two weeks. And there's a whole backstory behind that that we don't have to necessarily get into. But with those numbers in mind, right? If, if everyone is your customer and no one is your customer, that is a mm-hmm. mantra worth memorizing. If everyone is your customer, no one is your customer. You will run out of money before you succeed. Mm-hmm. It's very expensive to sell to everybody. But if you have to choose your 1,000 true fans and ask yourself, what if I could only have 1,000 customers? Who would they be? And you can actually start with that question before you even figure out who your, what your product is. Like which markets, which demographics, which psychographics do you know extremely well because you are part of them? And then you can determine what you sell. Most people start with some kind of half cocked idea for a product and then they run out trying to find people to sell to. That's a very expensive way to do things. In the case of the four hour work week, I knew that I was going to go after initially 20 to 35 year old tech savvy males in San Francisco, New York, Chicago, LA, and a few cities. That was it. And I knew that if I hit that domino, it would then bleed over into the same, the same demographics for women. And then the age ranges would bleed out and so on. And uh, that's how it ended up being as broadly accepted in 40 plus languages as it was. But I started with writing the book for two friends and then targeting a very specific group of, in my case, 20,000 or so people. And I knew that they were gonna read five or six outlets, TechCrunch, TechMeme, Gizmodo, a few things. So I could advertise in such a way that I appeared ubiquitous. I appeared to be a large player, but in reality, I was a big fish in a very small pond with a very, very precise product. And uh, what 1000 True Fans will teach you is A, if you really play the game well and you think about, if you if kind of measure twice and cut once with your thinking about your audience and your product and the, the smallest possible, you know, minimal viable audience, that you can double, triple, 10x your income with mm-hmm. a thousand people. With a thousand people, it makes it much seem much more attainable. And that's where you should start. Like Shopify, I just mentioned it again because it's a company I know so well, or when I advised Uber in the very early days, they did not start out by trying to appeal to a hundred million people. They started with a very small subset, tiny, tiny subset, a tiny fraction of the population in San Francisco and solving a problem with cabs. That's it. And the, the law of category that I mentioned, which is this chapter within the 22 immutable laws of marketing, teaches you how to think about differentiation, how you can be a first or an only. You can do that with price, right? So for instance, there are a million tequila brands out there. I'm in Austin, Texas right now. Patron Tequila came out and decided to dominate the highest end of tequila and where you could get a shot of another tequila for $6 in the United States. Patron came in, they said, okay, we're gonna make it $32. That seems crazy. And yet there was a market for it. And they, they became the ultra premium tequila as just as one example, right? Which was founded by the way, by the, one of the co-founders of Paul Mitchell hair, hair, hair Systems, which was a huge hair care brand in the US. They're completely unrelated, but similarly designed to be the, the dominating force in a category, right? So can you be can you be the best? Can you be the most expensive? Could you be the first of X in the same way as one example in the 22 mutable laws of marketing was uh, 
looking at, I don't know, I don't know why my, all my examples are, are alcohol right now. I haven't had, had anything to drink in a month. Maybe that's why I'm just like jonesing for a glass of wine. But um, at the time that this book was written, because this was written a few decades ago, there was light beer and there was an imported beer. Okay. And, and the light beer was the first of its kind. It, it dominated that category because it created it. And then there was, uh, there was imported beer. There was no imported light beer. There was no hmm. imported light beer. And Amstel Light created that category. And because they created it, they dominated it. They were able to own it. And you can do that for very small things. And in some cases that, that entails creating a new label often does just like the four hour work week had lifestyle design as a concept. And because it was the first to plant a flag in that real estate of the mindscape of readers, I was able to not own it forever because I wanted to release it into the wild, but to really have like a, a first mover advantage with that for a long mm -hmm. time. Um, so what I'm describing right now are principles because the tools change. If you look at what was written about in 2007, and then in the revised edition in 2009, most of the tools are outdated, but the principles are not. And it's important to learn the principles first and foremost, because if you learn the principles, you can find the right tools. If you start with the tools, but don't understand the principles, you're gonna make a lot of expensive mistakes. So one last thing I'll say is everyone should read The Effective Executive by Peter Drucker. Hmm. The, effect, the Effective Executive was written decades ago, and it is the best book on productivity that I've ever read. And what it underscores is what you do is more important than how you do anything, because it is possible to do lots of stupid, unimportant, menial things quickly. That does not make you productive. It is about choosing your targets really well. And uh, that book more than really almost any other, I would say the other book is the 80-20 principle by mm -hmm. Richard Koch, K-O-C-H. If you combine the effective executive with Richard Koch, the 80-20 principle, you, if you just read what I just mentioned, you are ready to begin testing. You'll be ready. You don't have to read hundred books. You don't have to do 17 MBA programs. Um, there are resources that you should avail yourself of, but really it's, it's, it's about getting on the playing field and starting to kick some soccer balls. Like if you're trying to learn to play soccer with books, you're going to get your face ripped off. As soon as you get out there, you got to just start screwing around and kicking the balls. So anyway, I've been talking for a while, so I'll stop. But those, those are a few of the things that you can do and read and really absorb to put on the proper set of lenses to look at entrepreneurship as a game that you can win. Hmm. I just want to pick up on one of those things. Um, when we think about those, those two books you mentioned at the beginning, a thousand true fans and 22 immutable laws. Uh, and we, and we consider the size of the market in New Zealand, you know, we're small here. So we're, we're, where we may only have in a particular niche a couple of hundred or thousand customers, which doesn't necessarily sustain a business, the ability with e-commerce to then stay in that same niche, but go to a global audience where you could have millions of customers and therefore be a viable business. I think that is, that's the power of like what the e-commerce tools can do, because you're absolutely right about the principle. It's about how do we then apply the principle in the context of our small economy, right? And, and so that's where those tools can be so good. And we notice so often uh, when we talk to business owners who are starting to walk the journey of digital marketing or e-commerce, that actually they are so confused and, and almost um, prevented from moving forward and knowing what to do because there's just so much knowledge out there and almost conflicting knowledge sometimes. You know, there's more than seven thousand martech tools it's like which ones do we use which combination is going to work for our business and i think that people can feel a little incapacitated by information overload so you've brought us back to some really good principles that can be used and then when we have capability development programs that help to just focus on the few things the 80 20 rule you know what are the few things that are actually going to work then it enables those business owners who are looking at it to just go okay here's my pathway 
this is actually doesn't need to be complicated. It can be just a matter of applying these things which are proven. <laughs> and we're just seeing that that has a massive cut through here in New Zealand. Yeah, totally. And so, so let me let me comment. You, you just brought up a number of important things and I want to I want to add to that. So I'll say two things. One is one is very technology dependent. And that is in a post COVID world where there may be future waves, there will be future pandemics. Uh, I hate to say that, but it's true. And in this changing world, even if you intend to focus on retail, if we look at a kind of post-game analysis of, for instance, the restaurants in the United States that were able to pivot and do well during COVID, they were the restaurants that had some form of communicating with their customers. Most restaurants, most retail establishments have no direct relationship with their customers. So even if you never intend to sell via e-commerce, it is worth becoming familiar with some of the tools so that you're able to communicate with your customers and your prospective customers. Without that, you're lost. Without that, you're a ship without an anchor. Uh, so e-commerce and the tools of e-commerce can be used not just to grow businesses, but to build resilience into businesses and into the economy. This is really, really important, right? So it's not just a launch pad for a rocket ship. It's also a safety net. Mm. This is really, really, really important. Mm. I did a, a podcast with uh, Nick Kakonis, who is the co-founder of Alinea and a number of, of the best known restaurants in the United States. And they had their most successful weeks ever in terms of revenue after COVID. Mm. And uh, the way they did that is described in the podcast and it's available for free. So I, I won't get into it right now. Kokonas, K-O-K-O-N-A-S. Uh, but the, the point is this technology provides a safety net. And in addition to being a launch pad, the second thing I'll say is coming back to what I mentioned about separating e-commerce from business and thinking about business first to, uh, to underscore what you said, Shay, about making it easy before you touch the technology, I mean, you can do your due diligence and your research and your market analysis online, but keep it simple, right? If you're a 22 year old guy, like maybe you shouldn't sell strollers if you don't have a kid, like <laughs> this may not be your ideal market. Come up with something that you think your friends would buy and then try to sell it to them. Don't build a huge website. Don't do anything. Like come up with what it is and, and try to sell it to your friends and say, if I built this or if I offered this service, would you buy it for this price? And if they say yes, ask them to pay in advance. Yeah. And if they don't, you have a problem. They're BSing you. And th that seems primitive. It's so uncool. It's not using the slick new artificial intelligence, blah, 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 blah. And it is so much more reliable as a predictor of success than almost anything else. And there's an expression that, um, uh, that you hear in Silicon Valley a lot, which is no product survives its first contact with customers. And you, you got to get out of the academic theoretical planning and onto the playing field as quickly as possible. It doesn't mean you are sloppy, but it means that as soon as you have an inkling of a market you understand, the 1000 true fans you could rely on for sustainable income, the product that scratches your own itch, a problem that you have had or still have, or a dream you want to pursue that does not currently have a good solution. Perhaps it's something you're cobbling together a bunch of things to address. Once you have that and you think it's something you could sell to people you know, you don't have to build a website. Sketch out your pitch, talk about the product features, what you would offer, whether it's a service or otherwise, and try to sell it. Uh, that would be my advice. Once you do that, and if it doesn't work, try, try again, iterate. Try something else. Come up. Don't with be more so ideas. wedded to the product that it's like your baby, right? Like it's yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a concept. <laughs> we'll yeah, choose. which is which which is also why it's helpful to do that early. Because if you if you think you've got the best idea since sliced bread, 
and you haven't told anyone and you build a website and you print business cards and you make t-shirts, you are going to have such sunk cost that it will be difficult for you psychologically to pivot. And that's a dangerous place to be. That's like a gambler who's gone into debt in the casino and is just going to keep betting because they're like, I'm going to make it back. I'm going to make it back. That is not where you want to end up. Mm. Uh, So those are another uh, maybe primitive kind of caveman entrepreneurship recommendations that, that translate really well. Yeah, just to add on something you mentioned around having a, a relationship with the product or knowing, having an intimate understanding of what you're trying to do there. You know, one of the things that I see a lot of entrepreneurs doing is looking or searching for an idea as opposed to looking for what they can actually be invested into or become invested in long term because the more time you spend on it the deeper your relationship is going to be with that vertical with that problem area so you got to be really excited about it and and want to be an expert in that space at some point uh, uh, the deeper you go down the road yeah and also if 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 you're just looking at market size which is another mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs make and maybe we can talk about this later i mean there's a lot of fetishizing of silicon valley venture backed startups Forget about that. I mean, if the the, the venture capital backed startup environment is a very, it can be a very zero sum game where there are a few Mm -hmm. winners and a lot of losers. That is not what we're talking about. I've played that game, but it's like going to the casino. I don't want you guys to go to the casino. I don't want anyone to go to the casino. I want you to (laughs) have a methodical, almost military like operation where like rule number one is don't lose rule number one is don't lose don't lose your money and you can be very successful that way and there are a lot of businesses that later become huge when they approach it that way and so, so that's kind of point number one point number two is that uh you can borrow from some of these silicon valley learnings with books like the uh, the lean startup by eric reese or the four steps to the epiphany when you're thinking about products. Uh, But the vast majority of successful businesses are those that you have never heard of. That's really important to remember. Uh, And you can, with a very small market, still build massively successful, successful, sustainable businesses. And if you want to be successful for the long term, to, to come back to your point, Joseph, If you know a market and it is solving a problem that you had or have, you are going to be excited and you will have the necessary enthusiasm and endurance to get through the setbacks that you will face. You're going to have long nights. You're going to have challenges. You're going to have disappointments. You may have to hire and fire people. There are going to be bumps along the way. And if it's not something you really care about, you're going to quit. So it needs to be something that on some level you care about or believe in. If you want to stack the deck in your favor, if you want to throw a Hail Mary, be my guest, but that's just not how I recommend doing things. Mm. Yeah, and I think is one of the things we've noticed around the having those strong foundations and in fact, some of the misconceptions around e-commerce is like, if we just have a website and we put it up there, we're going to make sales. I think that that is a, that is a definitely an old story that does not work. And um in terms of building those really strong foundation businesses, whether they're e-commerce focused or not, just a really solid business would involve that, that a system that we, we think is, needs to be in place of three parts. That first part is how do I get traffic into my site, into my store, whether that's um, online traffic, ideally, or even if it's footfall, physical traffic, a real understanding of how to drive traffic and bring people in. And then the second thing is not just the traffic, but actually how do you ensure that you're converting that traffic really well, that you're messaging appropriately and that you're convincing them that they need to go from looking at your stuff to actually buying your stuff. So that's the second part of the system. And then the third part is ensuring that continued conversation with them, the email autoresponder, the database, 
so that that group of customers who have brought from you before or who haven't yet brought because they haven't built a relationship with your brand enough are actually in the mindset to buy again. And that's sort of to Tim's point around the restaurants as well, like businesses that have the three parts of that system are likely to have a really solid foundation to continue to interact with their customers, bring more customers in and know what kind of um, outcomes that that's going to bring into their business. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I would also just reiterate that it's very important, I think, for governments, and this is not limited to New Zealand, this is true everywhere, to realize that digitally enabling and educating entrepreneurs in your country is not just important for growth, it is important for resilience and disaster preparedness. It provides options to, to keep currency and capital circulating in your country in the case of disasters, whether those are pandemics, whether those are natural disasters, whether those are infrastructure disasters, uh, there, there is, I think, an imperative for governments. And this, this is, I, I think, all the more relevant for New Zealand because of its mm -hmm. geographically isolated nature to build resilience into the economy and uh, a anti-fragility, not just resilience, but anti-fragility into the economy by digitally enabling as many people as possible. I, I think that's a, 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 a survival imperative and also a, uh, an incredibly potent cocktail yeah. for e economic mm -hmm. growth. Mm. And, and you've seen I'll, a lot of that shade, right? With yeah, the divide totally across New Zealand. We've, we've seen it on the ground, but we've also seen it in the in, in the government advisory conversations that I've been involved in. And you know, Tim, what we're finding is it sometimes takes a pandemic or a disaster just to shake the government to go, "Wow, we need to do something here," because yeah. you know, ninety-seven percent of New Zealand businesses, small businesses, ninety percent are zero to five kind of employees, so micro really, and like in a lockdown, most of them can't trade. So as a government, you go, whoa, this is a blind spot we've never looked at before. And with COVID, it has really accelerated the government's response to supporting small businesses here in New Zealand. And in fact, our Minister for Small Business, uh, Stuart Nash, came out and said, okay, the, his vision for New Zealand is to have the most digitally enabled small businesses in the world. Now, when we set the goalposts that high and an aspiration like that, we, we're going to be looking at some really revolutionary strategies around how do we turn on businesses right throughout our country who are not big, you know, who are these micro enterprises that are going to need a real range of interesting support. And I think then it becomes a question of, okay, what kind of infrastructure do we need to build as a country? Digital infrastructure, yeah. physical infrastructure, to enable e-commerce to be a norm and to be able to be taken up by so many businesses. So it's, it, you know, I think our government's responding really well to that and, and we just got to build the ecosystem, build the infrastructure now. Yeah, and, and, and COVID is really not a worst case scenario. COVID has really been a warning shot. This is a, this is a flesh wound. It is not nearly as, as lethal or scary as many other uh, you know, viruses that exist. And um, we just happen to be very lucky. I mean, it was a, a virus in some ways, uh, perfectly, uh, perfectly designed to uh, confuse very smart people. And uh, the, despite the atrocious economic impact, it, 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 as you said, Shay, it, it really just served to illustrate the fragility and weaknesses in a lot of systems. And it's great to hear about Stuart Nash. That's extremely uh, heartening to hear. And there are role models for this, right? You can look at say Estonia with digital literacy and coding. You can look at uh, Singapore as a fantastic example of, of what can be done in terms of absorbing and applying best principles. Uh, also a great example of how to attract and retain top talent in government, mm. within government. Uh, so there are uh, many examples of how this can be, how this can be fostered. I, I think that mm. 
throwing money at the problem uh, is also another way to do it. I mean, there are ways to collaborate with uh, with different companies. And just just as an example, and I know I've mentioned this a few times, but the uh, you know Shopify has partnered with New York State. They've partnered with uh, the government of Canada. They've partnered with uh, the UK to provide immediate relief to merchants and the Victoria example, the 600,000 small businesses representing half of all private sector jobs, that was part of an announcement related to a collaboration with uh, the state of Victoria in uh, hmm. Australia, which was a $20 million initiative by the Victoria state government, right? So they bring capital to the table and then you have partners. It could be a Shopify, it could be zero, it could be any number of different private sector players who agree to provide infrastructure or memberships or tools at reduced cost or no cost for a period of time. And that type of collaboration between public sector and private sector can drive a lot of uh, entrepreneurial activity. And you know, I mentioned earlier that you need inf information, inspiration, and incentives. Uh, the incentives are really important. Like if you want people to figure out entrepreneurship, like throw $20 million at it and see what happens. Like people will wake up if there are financial mm -hmm. incentives, there, there could be potential tax rebates for people who form businesses and employ at least X number of people. You have to guard against perverse incentives in the respect that you want to be a, aware of how that might be gamed or abused. But overall, the vast majority of people are going to be good actors and uh, the return on investment for providing financial incentives, I think, especially in the form of competitions, can be unbelievably high in terms of job creation and company creation. Yeah. I know that's something you've been very much involved in with Shopify for a while, Tim, and, uh, and Shay, you adopted that into New Zealand, um, the build a business competition. W what have been some of the lessons that you've learned in terms of, you know, how to make them successful and the broader impact that that has created in those environments? And we'd love to hear from you, Shay, as well, in terms of what are the aspects you've adopted culturally to fit New Zealand well? And, and how is the program going well? It sounds like you just finished this Sunday, right? Yeah. Yep. Yesterday. Wow. Yeah, Tim, so what are the things that you've, you've learned from it? It's, I believe it's been almost 10 years since it started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so just as context, so the, the, the Shopify Build a Business competition, uh, I, I suppose in some respect co-created with uh, Toby and Harley, uh, respectively, uh, both, let's just call it co-founders of Shopify. It started in 2010 uh, with a $100,000 grand prize, all right? And it ran for seven years. So I want, I, I want people to keep in mind this starting number. So the grand prize was $100,000, which to Shopify at the time was extremely expensive. <laughs> they, they couldn't really afford it. <laughs> uh, but it wasn't betting the farm also because it was going to be paid out later after the entire competition ran. And there were a lot of safeguards. So it wasn't risky per se, but it was very intimidating to them. Started in 2010, ran for seven years, created more than 100,000 new businesses. Okay, so for every dollar that they put into the program in the beginning in the terms of prize money, they created a, a more than one business. I mean, I wow. want that to sink in because the scope of it is just absurd. I mean, yeah. the return on investment is incredible. Those businesses have sold more than $1 billion wow. uh, in, in that period of time, more than $1 billion dollars USD, so 1 billion US dollars in gross monthly value, not total, in GMV. Uh, and it's produced a lot of companies that have had later large scale and exited. And I mean, there's a company called Movement Watches, MVMT Watches, which started in 2013. Five years later, 2018, it sold for $100 million to Movado Group. And there are many, many examples of this. To give you an example of some of the companies that have won these competitions, so you might think, oh, it's going to be some huge thing. It's the next Uber. It's the next Airbnb. Uh, there have been companies that made artisanal, leather-bound, handmade iPad cases. Hmm. All right. So super expensive, handmade, old-fashioned iPad cases. 
Barack Obama ended up buying one, was photographed with it. <laughs> and and uh, these types of niche products can create extremely powerful, resilient, consistent cash flow positive businesses. Uh, and I mean, everything you can possibly imagine in terms of product have been sold in these build a business competitions. And just to come back again to the initial commitment and prize money, $100,000 created more than 100,000 new businesses over seven years that at one point, you know, totaled $1 billion USD in growth month, uh, gross monthly volume. These are, these are huge numbers, right? So that can be, that type of incentive can be put in place with some structure, especially in partnership with private sector businesses who have the staff and technology and know-how to help implement such a competition with the financial support of governments and the endorsement of governments. Tim, what was the anticipated kind of return that they were you know, wanting from that challenge when they set out to commit their hundred thousand? <laughs> you know, there, there wasn't a large financial target that was made concrete. Uh, I simply knew, I mean, this is going to sound funny, but just given all of my experience in the, in the world of entrepreneurship, I knew that a hundred thousand dollars would be a drop in the bucket compared to the ROI, because I understood the business model of Shopify. Of course, it's in their best interest. If they have merchants on the platform who are paying fees to Shopify, to have as many fast growing businesses as possible. And it's in their best interest to have merchants and entrepreneurs who are doing well on the platform. As you know, and I'd love to hear more about your experience. So in this case, this is a good example of what I was talking about earlier with respect to risk mitigation. I knew that even if it failed, it would not fail completely. And let's just say, hypothetically, it was complete disaster and Shopify lost $20,000. They would be able to recover from that and learn so much in the process of running that first competition that a second competition would almost certainly be successful. So it, that would be an example of affordable downside, right? Establishing hmm. an ambitious project because, and this comes back to the law of category, this was, this was the largest entrepreneurial competition that had ever been held. $100,000, six figures, symbolically very important, made it the largest that had ever been held. That got a lot of PR, a lot of attention, which improved the value of the equity in Shopify mm -hmm. itself. It drove merchants to the platform who didn't necessarily participate in the competition. And then you had all of the ROI on top mm -hmm. of that that was attributed to the competition. So from my perspective, it was the opportunity to, to do a first, to get a lot of PR, and then to test a bunch of assumptions that could be corrected if we iterated later. But I knew that the downside was very minimal and mm. was, uh, uh, was affordable. The economics, the economics and the, the probabilities uh, were really attractive. So that's how we approached it. There, there, there were, as, as far as I can tell, no expectations of a multi-million dollar return, even though ultimately... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at them now. <laughs> right? So just, just curious though, on, on that point, you said 100,000 businesses in seven years. Um, did you see sort of uh, kind of like an exponential type of curve in terms of the business that were created or was it pretty proportional to the number of years that, you know, this program was kind of running? You know, that, that would be a, a better question for the, uh, the team at Shopify because they have... Uh, well, they, they have all the access to the, to the data, sure. but if, if I had to, to guess, and I mean, this is informed guessing, uh, I would guess that it was a nonlinear curve yeah. because the first year, as it is with anything, it was a struggle to create the mass awareness of the competition. The competitions got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because every time it worked, Shopify was willing to put a little more capital, a little more uh, or a lot more hours yeah. uh, from their company into investing and pushing the envelope. So each year they did that, the bigger the partnerships got, they had media partnerships, they had uh, all sorts of company partnerships, the prizes, the trips, everything became so much bigger. Yeah. 
so I would anticipate that 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 increased willingness to invest because the Shopify guys are very smart was reflective of of a nonlinear curve of growth. Yeah. Because I just want to highlight the value of repetition when you build pro programs like this. Mm -hmm. You don't see the value right away. And it might not be as apparent up front, but you just keep reinvesting. If you actually stop too early, you don't last long enough to see the value of it. And we yeah, see well, a lot you, of these yeah, patterns. Exactly. You, don't, you also don't have the opportunity to iterate, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so the, uh, as with many things, if we're if we're talking about say a, a possible governmental collaboration with let's just say Stuart Nash as an example wanted to partner with private sector companies to create incentives to really galvanize the creation of many companies uh, which would be intended to then have uh, an effect on economic growth economic resilience and employment just as a few examples, also gross, you know, exported product. I think it would be very, very important to commit to at least three years of doing that in some fashion. So choosing a format, if it's intended to have many iterations, to have to have a multi-year commitment of some type, and that might mean that the the incentives up front are lower, or mm -hmm. uh, they, or the decision might be made: we are post COVID. We're in a rebuild period. Therefore, we want to have kind of a balloon payment up front. So we want to have this larger curve of adoption in the beginning with a larger financial incentive. And then to continue with that for a period of time as we iterate, because here's, here's, here's the great thing about this, is as you learn best practices that apply specifically within the New Zealand ecosystem, uh, it becomes more and more cost effective to execute these types of competitions. In the beginning, there will be some waste uh, because mm -hmm. you're going to be making mistakes. And that's part of the process of experimentation and finding best practices for this particular type of collaboration. Yeah. Awesome. Shay, it would be great to hear from you in terms of the application of that in New Zealand, how the program has gone. Yeah, yeah. So. You know, when we were looking at, okay, it's a really important time for us to have an e-commerce course. You know, we'd, we'd been um, running our own e-commerce business, uh, selling products into the US. And so we had, an, we had an, a sense of the power of it. And then it came time to actually build something that was going to help Maori businesses and Maori individuals go from no base of understanding e-commerce, the tools, the strategies, through to actually having a business that was generating income and ideally accelerating the speed that that can happen over. So we just took the typical copy and pimp model. So we, um, we set out and we looked at what was out there and we landed on the Shopify uh, uh, programs and, and work had, that had been done. And um, so we you know, had a conversation with Shopify and they were quite keen on looking at how can we develop something particularly focused on indigenous people that would have the same kind of outcomes that Tim just mentioned. So they partnered with us. And I mean, that was great uh, credibility for ourselves, you know, um, just to realize that here we are, the small little business in New Zealand that's serving a small little market of Maori business owners and actually Shopify, you know, this global company that's got reach right around the world is keen to partner to not just work in New Zealand, but actually to take that program global. And then we went, okay, who were the, you know, what were the things that Shopify was doing in those kinds of programs? And so we looked at the comfort challenge series that Tim had done and we went, okay, we're going to drop that in. So we started the program off with five comfort challenges, you know, and, and why that was is to build people's mindset and to ensure that we were working with a group who will, you know, we're comfortable with, with the uncomfortable, we're comfortable with growth, uh, we're comfortable with putting themselves out there. And that became the, the funnel, if you like, we had hundreds of applications from Maori in a, in a matter of really only a couple of weeks, you know, or like a, about a month, four weeks or so, we had hundreds of applications. And the comfort challenges was a great way to sort of, to figure out who was really going to be able to commit to this. And, and then we just developed a 12 month, uh, sorry, a, a 12 to 13 week program journey um, utilizing Shopify 
a lot of the Shopify uh, re re uh, resources and expertise. But our approach was a little bit different, Yosef. And one thing that we did innovate on, and this comes from our innate understanding of how to work well with Māori um, from having you know worked with Māori for years, is that we, we made sure there was a lot of intensive wraparound support and pastoral care around the Māori entrepreneurs. And I think that that was contextually really important because we are talking about overcoming a lot of mindset challenges, even around I can't have a business, you know, that's not something that people in my community have, or mm -hmm. I can't sell my product and make money off it. You know, there's all sorts of limiting beliefs that we're having to continuously overcome um, when we're working with our people, as well as that we're starting from a very low base of understanding. So, so around technology and around how business even works. So we wanted to make sure we were really uh, wrapping some good resources around them. So that kind of wraparound support meant that we had uh, multiple coaches and experts that would come in from Shopify as well as from, um, from other parts of the ecosystem right around the world. Um, we had um, uh, coaches on standby, you know, to be there like 24 seven. We had our program team who'd regularly review the work uh, in the websites. Um, we had a whole lot of templates and tools that could accelerate people through the process. So rather than them just kind of have to learn everything, it's like, here's a template, bang, implement that. And, you know, you could be online a lot quicker. So I think that that helped. And having it over 12 weeks at quite an intensive um, group-based program meant that everyone was learning together, sharing together, helping each other out. And I think that, you know, the way that Māori learn is really in a group, that, that approach to feeling connected with each other is really important. And that's made a huge difference. And I'm not sure, Tim, whether Shopify has done stuff as groups of entrepreneurs um, in the program since, but that's one particular uh, approach that we that we use, which has made a phenomenal difference in ensuring the cohort feel well supported by each other, feel part of something bigger than themselves. And um, it, it also helps with that future pathway, you know, so we don't always have to be there because they can rely on one another as they continue to grow their businesses from here. Yeah, I think that's super important. The, the building of cohorts and groups so that you have that peer support, I think is in incredibly important because uh, you know, it, anything worth doing is going to have its challenges and the, you know, entrepreneurship is no exception. They're going to be, <laughs> they're going to be uh, growing pains. Um, so having that peer support is really important. Agreed. Mm. Mm. Because you're, you're touching upon a theme around more collaborative approaches to actually building e-commerce businesses, as opposed to what you explained earlier, Tim, around the zero sum game, uh, all or nothing, um, grow at all cost type of models that we see coming from you know the likes of Silicon Valley, especially if you're just building software technology and raising VC capital. It's quite a different landscape in which you're building new e-commerce businesses here. Yeah, and uh, and you know, Shay, to to your point of mindset, uh, this is really important, and uh, there are a lot of uh, assumptions that can uh, stymie or inhibit. <laughs> There's my dog drinking the water super loudly again. Thanks, Molly. So, just for just for a little background music for everybody. Um, <laughs> can you guys hear that, or is it just is it just behind me? Um, in any case, you hear it a little Molly. bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll try to talk over. Okay, there we go. All right, so yeah, okay, Muhammad can can hear, uh, uh, can hear Molly. All right, so what I was going to say is these these mindset challenges are not minor, right? If you believe you cannot do something, you are not going to have the confidence to iterate over time and experiment, and you will view mistakes as failure as opposed to feedback. So, you know, one thing that I would love to do if I if I, if I get, get on the ground in New Zealand at some point is to look at highlighting innovators and entrepreneurs via the podcast and other things that are best done kind of on the ground in person to show different exemplars 
right, case studies of people who, re who represent a broad spectrum of possibilities. And uh, it's, it's so critically important, right? Because if, if we use the, the US as one example, if every magazine cover you see with an entrepreneurial case study is Mark Zuckerberg, you don't look like or sound like or have the, uh, the educational background or the computer science background of a Zuckerberg, you're going to perhaps assume that the entrepreneurial path is only accessible to that type of person. And that would be an incorrect assumption, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so to have localized examples of entrepreneurial achievement and not just entrepreneurial achievement, but different paths and approaches to entrepreneurship, because um, you don't need to be an extroverted computer science major, swashbuckling risk taker to be an entrepreneur. That's nonsense. That's one archetype and there are a thousand others. And guess what? One of them is gonna be pretty similar to you and, uh, and will inspire you. So hopefully at some point, mm. I'll get a chance to, to showcase some folks on the ground. Yeah, and I think we're in the early big... stage of building those kind of uh, those, those undercover leaders of the movement, you know, like, it's e-commerce is, is still a, at a pretty fledgling state in New Zealand. So it's about uncovering who these people are and demonstrating that regardless of what community and or what they look like, there's someone like you who's actually doing something like this. And for us, because we don't have that many Maori um, case studies on our program, we were actually, um, we were um, showcasing and having guest speakers from other indigenous nations around the world, from Canada, from Hawaii, from America, and other parts of the world who could, you know, tell the story of their business growing, but it was a story that was relatable because it was based on the same kind of foundation of principles, or they came from the same kind of background of historical challenges being indigenous that Maori do. So I think that made a huge difference around the mindset piece as well. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. Mm. And, and you two spoke quite a bit about the challenge, the um, build a business competition and uh, the global one and, and the New Zealand one. We're very interested to see what would be possible, especially during this time to create more repetition of those programs and provide more education, more access to local uh, aspiring entrepreneurs in, in this space here, because um, a lot of jobs are being displaced at the moment and certain industries are really struggling. Um, and the digital divide is also growing. So I think there's more of a need to do a lot of uh, uh, programs like that right now. So I'd, I'd just be curious to hear what would be the excitement level just even in this conversation to get involved in something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would love to sort of help match make and uh, participate in uh, in uh, in building uh, or at least implementing some type of competition it's it's just such low-hanging fruit mm -hmm. and it's a proven model we've already seen it work in multiple geographies with hundred thousand plus businesses um, we see Shay and his team implementing really effectively already right on a on a small scale within New Zealand so we have a proof of concept we have pilot studies that are already being executed and I think that I, I should add a fourth thing a fourth pillar right to the table of entrepreneurship we talked about information inspiration incentives the most important one of all is hope you need hope. You need to have some hope that things can improve. And if, if the government, any government really, uh, wants to turn things around and build resilience, anti-fragility and growth, uh, people need to first and foremost believe that things can get better. And one way to galvanize and build morale and support hope is through the excitement of a competition and that kind of promise of a possibly better future that that provides. I think it's uh, not necessarily through Shopify, it could be with Shopify, but just partnering private and public interests for the common good in the form of some type of competition provides this electricity to the air, much like a, you know, Willy Wonka golden ticket. I mean, it really, it, it really galvanizes a lot of excitement.
and I've seen that now, you know, over the span of, of seven years and beyond. Yeah, I think, um, you know, looking at the idea of the competition, having, being able to prove that it works here is a great starting point because then we know, like to Tim's point, what do we need to test, learn and iterate? What do we need to iterate differently next time to, to be able to scale it and have it so that more people can then participate in that challenge? And I think this is where the ecosystem comes into it. Like we've been able to start to engage the broader ecosystem in our, in our program to showcase that uh, to some ecosystem players in the business community, what the possibilities are. And I think that's really important because we haven't had an ecosystem traditionally that has much of an understanding and appreciation of e-commerce mm. and yet it's such a solid ecosystem. So if, the more that everyone can be a little more fluent in the concepts of it, the more we can understand what roles we each play here in New Zealand in helping spawn an entrepreneurial movement, an e-commerce movement. And then I think the potential for doing this stuff at, at, at real scale is huge. You know, we look across mm -hmm. at our cousins in the Pacific uh, Islands who in many cases have had dramatic um, uh, reduction in their tourism numbers, which has decimated their economies. And so, while there are other, while there are barriers that we need to be mindful of around e-commerce, where we can look to other, support other countries and other indigenous peoples through a similar kind of challenge approach, where we can have different indigenous communities kind of competing against each other to have the the best e-commerce businesses everybody is going to be growing through that that journey everyone's going to be learning together and we can start to look at what is a better way to doing business as well because mm -hmm. if we were to judge those kind of things based off metrics that are not purely around uh, revenue or profitability but are actually factoring in there the contributions that those businesses are make to more holistic outcomes social outcomes environmental outcomes and basing the competition of the challenges around that then we re you know we really are showing and demonstrating that business a uh, better business is possible yeah well thanks very much we've very much run out of time uh, the conversation has, has gone really fast so I want to say a massive thank you to you, Shay and Temp, for this dialogue. I think you've given a lot for all of us to digest and, and think about, and, and especially a lot of local entrepreneurs who are thinking of jumping into the e-commerce bandwagon or looking to scale their businesses and a lot of resources. We're going to be posting this video online as well, so you can come back and watch it later. Um, before we finish off, uh, my colleague Paul is going to send a very short um, uh, uh, poll here just to get a sense around how useful it's been. Uh, if you can just fill it up shortly now, that'd be super helpful. And I'll pass it over to you, Shay, to help us with the closing karakia. Yeah, sure. I guess our closing karakia for today will be about clearing uh, our space and providing us safe passage into whatever activity we're about to go off and do after this call. Um, it asks that our restrictions that we're facing be moved aside um, so that our pathway is clear uh, and we can return to our everyday activities feeling enriched, feeling unified, and feeling blessed. Kia whakaeri a te tapu, kia wāte ai te ara, kia tūruki whakataha ai, kia tūruki whakataha ai, haumie huie taiki e. Taiki e. Well, thanks so much. And we're super thrilled to have you both in EHF and contributing to New Zealand in this way. So thank you. Cheers, Cheers Joseph. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone. See you. Kakite. <laughs>